Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 522. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 2nd of August, 2019. Okay, you know you have responsibilities. I'm going to add a new responsibility. I want you guys to take your phones and uh, set the do not disturb function. Uh, because this is an important episode you need to watch. I turned mine on for a whole hour. If we go an hour, you're allowed to click off after 40 minutes. But please share this episode, comment on this episode, like this episode, and if you like podcasts, we have a podcast that you can listen to as well. That's in the show notes on YouTube. Gentlemen, welcome back to the program. How are you doing today? Fantastic, wonderful, great to be here, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Gavin, <laughs> you, you look like you had a long day. How's your day? I mean, there's what's well, five hours difference, right? So if it's yeah. if it's uh, one o'clock here, it's six o'clock there. That's quick math. I, very, I'm a good math person. It is. It's been a very interesting day. I met um, I met a group of of, of 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 friends. My old boss, who was who was the vice chancellor who employed me at my university, lives locally, and there's a, a group of uh, elderly men. They call themselves awful, the, the old farts of Ludlow. I beg your pardon, those of you who had sensitive disposition. Um, it's reported speech. Uh, and meet together once a month to, um, to, to talk. And it's very interesting that, that although many of them are atheists and secularists, the conversation turns theological really quite quickly. Um, and uh, I, I always find myself asking the Lord to provide some traction for the kingdom, and it, and it always happens. So I've had that today. It's been very interesting. Ga Gavin, this, this sounds like a meeting of general synod, secularists and atheists, and sometimes <laughs> the topic turns to theology. Sometimes. And you, and you were the... Oh, if I may interject right now, um, we've had some questions on some recent shows. We've Our viewership has expanded uh, widely over the past few months, years, and people are basically saying, who are you people? Yes, and, who do you think you are? Yes. And one of the things, you know, and Gavin casually mentions the vice chancellor for whom I worked. Now, Gavin, does that mean you were a secretary, a janitor? What did you do at a university that allowed you to work for a vice chancellor? At my particular university, they modeled themselves in Oxford and Cambridge. And so the, the, the chaplain was a senior, was quite a senior person in the institution in the sense that he was a senior officer of the university and his, his line manager was the vice chancellor. So he would manage me. I would go and talk to him and uh, and answer for him, uh, to him for for my my job. And and um, it also meant that when the students sat in and occupied the administrative offices, um, once every two years, I was the person who acted as a negotiator between the two. So um, he became a good friend of mine. And um, he's in his late eighties, and he was retired locally. Uh, and um, so, so my my job as as chaplain at this place was was slightly more uh, functionally elevated than it might have been in other universities where where he would be a member of the pastoral team and well respected for that. Well, I can imagine you, Gavin, in a sort of a turtleneck shirt and a tweed coat with your hair a little fuzzy, uh, being the chaplain in the <laughs> for these students sitting in. Uh, oh, a, very, my. a very brief story. I, I, after I arrived, the vice chancellor called me into his office and said, I'm changing the way we're welcoming all the students. We're going to welcome them all in batches of 500. I'm going to do it personally, and I'm going to have two people next to me speaking with me. So we will all speak for five minutes with me. There'll be the president of the students' union and you. I said, Vice Chancellor, this is the most atheist university in the whole country. You cannot turn up to welcome all the new students with one of your sp the three speakers being the chaplain. It just, you know, people will blow a gasket anyway. What on earth do you expect me to say? Whereupon he said, what the Anglo-Saxon do I pay you for? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Right, right, Vice Chancellor, I will be there Monday morning and I will, uh, I will find something to say. Find uh, something to say, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we do need to move on to the news. Uh, woke up this morning, first story I read was on the Cramner blog. Uh, if you guys ever get to go out there, besides Anglican Inc. and Anglican Scripted, there's archbishopcramner.com and... Uh, on there, I saw shabby and shambolic 
the uh, Church of England still conspires against truth and justice in historic sexual abuse. I mean, yes, they do. It's like reading 1984 because the Church of England wants to deny the truth, wants to change the truth, wants to change history. Um, and when confronted on it, we, we meant well. You know, we, we meant to do the right thing. And that should be enough for you guys. And uh, I thought we could talk a little bit about the article. Uh, let's start with you, Gavin. You uh, forwarded it to me and said, well, we should talk about this. It's written by Martin Sewell. Martin Sewell is a lawyer. We very nearly, I very nearly made a rude joke about General Synod as George put that over the net to me. General Synod contains some, some very eminent and competent people of the highest caliber uh, and I hope Martin won't mind my saying, but he's but he's one of them. And one of the things he's done as a lawyer is to keep the Church of England's conscience clean over victims of sexual abuse. Uh, and to begin with, when I first began to read Martin's stuff, I thought, well, this is a no-brainer. This is, you know, this is just reportage because as soon as this stuff comes out into the open, obviously the institution will do the right thing. It's inconceivable that it won't uh, deal with this quickly, honestly, and, and cleanly. To our enormous surprise, it seems quite, though it has spent millions of pounds, appointed many skilled people in a Byzantine and labyrinthine structure. Uh, it's doing two things. One is it's obscuring who is in control still, because one of the questions Martin Sewell asks is, since they are continuing to not do the right thing, say the right thing, act in a fair way, who on earth is in control? Who is responsible for this mess? Uh, and the other thing is that they continue not to do the right thing. But in this particular case, it was because Matthew Innocent, um, who is uh, one of the best examples of a of a, a straightforward, uh, uncomplicated, wounded, wronged, abused clergyman at the hands of another clergyman, has asked the Church of England simply to pay fair, play fair by what happened to him to to to. To first of all, recognize it and acknowledge it, correct? Uh, yeah, acknowledge it, um, apologize, and find ways of trying to uh, make sure it doesn't happen in the future. Um, and what what happened in this particular case was he was invited to the latest hearings of ICSA, the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse, uh, and with him in the room is the Archbishop of Canterbury. And he laments as he's, as he's asked questions by the leading lawyer, a very competent woman in the process. Uh, and she asks about the apology. And he said, well, I haven't had one. And I'd like one. You know, it hurts. And I don't understand why it hasn't happened yet. Now, you, Martin Sewell makes the point that <laughs> you'd think that the archbishop would have been briefed at that point to turn around in his chair and say, Matthew, from the bottom of my heart, I weep with your tears, I, I, I share your pain as best I can, and I humbly apologize. If, if, if you haven't been apologized to at all or adequately, let it be now, here and now. And instead, the Archbishop of Canterbury not only didn't apologize, but he said he already had. <laughs> and so uh, at a previous meeting that he and Matthew had had at Lambeth Palace, and this is a surprise to Matthew because he didn't think the Archbishop had done. So Matthew and his legal team checked records. And the records of that meeting are very clear and very clearly minted. And the Archbishop had not apologized. In the ICSA meeting, he said he had and Matthew hadn't heard it. Now, we have one. Does, these that, does that mean he, he, he spoke in a very low voice? Or what does not hearing well, the, mean? The, the court reporter did not hear it as well, the person taking notes. So well, It means that either the Archbishop of Canterbury didn't know what had actually gone on and had forgotten and hadn't taken care to find out, or he was lying. Uh, it's 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 either incompetence or it's mendacity, um, and but 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 of a very serious kind in a, in a very public place in a very potent and symbolic way. Um, I mean, for goodness sake, uh, even if he'd apologised three times before, and and the, and the matter is raised just at a pastoral, uh, forget the word pastoral, at a human level, common humanity, sub-Christian common humanity, would you not do that? The Archbishop didn't. Now again, the Archbishop of York. Was, was asked the same questions, and he too was unable to issue any kind of apology. And what Martin Sewell is saying is, you know, what on earth is, is going on? And no wonder 
faced with these kind of experiences, the victims feel very cross. In fact, Matthew Innocent has made his own statement. He's talked about the way in which he's driven up and down the country to meetings in church house. Uh, the officials wouldn't speak to him. Uh, he remains not only apologized to, not only unapologized to, but 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 marginalized. And essentially, he's banging his fist on the table in frustration and saying, please behave with a minimum amount of courtesy and justice and compassion and, and do what you know has to be done and the Church of England doesn't. And so one or two people, Martin included, and a man called Stephen Parsons in another blog, is saying, who the heck's in control in the Church of England? Who's running this thing? Was the Archbishop forbidden to apologize? But because in actual fact, le legal liability is all, has been established. There are no issues of liability hanging on such a disclosure. Uh, you know, why is it such an immoral and incompetent mendacious mess well wasn't matthew locked out when he tried to uh approach in the in the is he the one that they would uh, not let into the cathedral no, no that or was, was that's a different person no, that, 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 um, that was one of justin welby's other pastoral triumphs when he was dean of liverpool which he has apologized for whether he's apologized for the mistake whether he's apologized to, to the person themselves we, okay. well, we find out so it's not well, just one. I, I think gavin we should say that uh, the Archbishop didn't apologize, he conceded that mistakes were made and that if, if people were offended, he was, he was sorry that they were offended. So the actual response is not uh, an admission of any uh, personal culpability, but sort of the mealy-mouthed institutional response uh, that a uh, CEO of a mid-level company would give after they've been discovered dumping nuclear waste in a river. And I, uh, I think if, if we are bringing some level, as I hope we are, of, of emotional uh, anger and frustration, let it not be our anger. It's anger for the victims. We are, we are not doing this to kick an institution or to kick some incompetent middle managers, even though they might deserve it. We're doing it because actually the victims have not yet been heard and treated uh, uh, with the dignity and the justice and the compassion that they quite properly deserve. And they would deserve it from any organization. They would deserve it in particular from a Christian church. And the fact that the Christian Church of England is failing in such a spectacular way is, is an extraordinary thing. If, if I may jump here in this point, Gavin, um, not all of the Church of England is failing. The House of Bishops as a, first off, I. I come into this saying that this is of such consequence to the character and integrity of the Church of England that if they do not act, their reputation will be almost, will, you'll have to start over. And for me, I'm appalled that the House of Bishops of the Church of England has decided to play ball with Archbishop Welby and St. Thomas' shutdown of discussion. And it is only the odd maverick or two, like the Bishop of Buckingham, with whom I disagree on many, many issues, who's on the far left, he has spoken out. Why is it only the Bishop of Buckingham and perhaps one or two others who have, who have actually done the right thing? How can they in any integrity put themselves forward as Christian bishops when they are displaying such a tremendous lack of integrity, lack of character, lack of any moral sensibility that they should be laughed at and pitied for their in, for their incompetence. Well, we know the answer, George, and the answer simply is that the, the Welby is a, is a very competent manager. I mean, he, he manages things. That was what he did. Uh, and he has made the appointment of people to the Episcopate conditional upon their keeping their mouths closed and speaking only when they are briefed to. So this is the condition of their employment and they're keeping to it. But, the, but Gavin, my point is that this is a salvation issue. This is an integrity issue. Well, I agree. I don't, I, don't, I don't mean that there is one party line that you must espouse, but rather this speaks to a very basic level, as you said earlier, of humanity. And if the bishops are not willing or able to live out their humanity, to live out their Christianity, what in God's name were they doing in that office? Well, in the past, the answer to who controlled the Church of England would have been that the Church of England was capable of having its direction remedied a bit by men of integrity who spoke out in the public place. Some, sometimes men of integrity who spoke well, and sometimes idiots who caused trouble. But, the, but, but they've been closed down now. That's not how the management of this particular organization now works.
and here is where I want to link it back. To, I apologize, Kevin, for That's jumping right. in, no, but no, here no, I no. want. But I think the most famous example in the twentieth century of somebody who spoke out on an issue of moral character was George Bell. During yep. the middle of the Second World War, George Bell stood up in the House of Lords and condemned the terror, the firebombing of Germany, as immoral. And in response, Winston Churchill basically put him, uh, exiled him to Siberia. He never got the uh, raise he was supposed to get. I mean, where are the George Bells of the Church of England today? Um, if, if Alan Wilson, the Bishop of Buckingham, is as close as we're going to get, well, praise God for Alan Wilson. I hope I got his name right. Uh, but why aren't there other men, or even women now, of integrity who are willing to do what Bell did? Well, I, I think the answer is the Church of England has gone astray. Now, I'm going to brag here. But I think my best 18 round is 106, maybe 107. I don't remember. It was a long time ago. But I now understand that if I'm in the Church of England at a certain cathedral, I can quit my membership at the golf club because I am allowed to, within the building structure itself, where the pews used to be, bring out my uh, set of seven clubs, probably don't need a wedge, and play some golf. Uh, Gavin, tell me a little bit about this wonderful story where you made the news in the BBC again. Well, this is where I go apoplectic too. That's <laughs> my story. To, uh, uh, I'm very pleased to say that the BBC television phoned me up and asked me for a comment. I guess they knew that I might not be hugely enthusiastic. Uh, I made a comment and uh, I, I, I think probably I'm pleased to say because I thought the comments were true. Uh, they, they made the BBC News in the south of England, but also also nationally. Uh, so so that's good. I mean, needless to say, being the BBC, they they portrayed both sides. So they began the interview by saying uh, a woman canon at the cathedral uh, said that um, this lovely pitch and putt golf course on the flagstones uh, in the second oldest cathedral uh, had bridges in it, and she her hope was that as people pitched and putted their way around the holy flagstones, uh, skirting one altar where our Lord's blood was shed to another one and to the pulpit where the word was preached and to the place where John Fisher was dragged out to his martyrdom, that they would think about bridges. She, she went on, not bridges between people and perhaps in their own lives. I, I, I think this is so fatuous that, that it's really hard to know where to begin. And, and in the briefest possible moment, I will say it contains a most terrible theological error about human beings and their relationship with God. It contains a very serious error about uh, about the nature of buildings and holiness. Uh, and it's, it is just so far away from being Christian in any sense that I... But I, I it, is that. this not the 21st, ver 21st century version of the Stations of the Cross? You're getting oh, people yeah. into the church. They get to experience <laughs> the different walls and plaques and stained glass windows. Um, I, I, isn't that is that that the purpose to bring people into the church? Oh, Kevin, that's a lovely idea and a very neat question too. The fact is, when when cathedrals and churches were built, they are built in the shape of Jesus' body, and they even went to the trouble to to set them on a slight angle to represent the, the death, the, his his death throes of the head slipped on the cross. So when you enter a cathedral you figuratively and literally enter into a, a semiotic representation of the body of Christ. You are, you are in his bowels, in his heart, in his mind as you walk around. Now, as you walk around, you may very well deepen your relationship with him by following the Stations of the Cross. All that is congruent and, 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 and blessed and holy. But, but to turn that place into a diverting entertainment center to keep people off the streets on a Saturday afternoon whilst they whilst everything is blocked out about God except their immediate pleasure is a is, is a category error well now George has animals come to his church it increases the popularity of his church it uh, ensures that uh, congregants who have animals get to have them blessed and uh, watered I don't know how the, it all works but uh, certainly there is a, a liturgical desire to have uh, events where people can come to the church and enjoy the church for being the church. 
Let the haute bourgeoisie bring their golf clubs and their golf caddies, golf caddies to be blessed and purged by the church so that they're no longer idols but servants of the living God. And I just about concede you could have a relationship between golf and the liturgy. But bring them in to play golf uh, where Christ's blood is spilt. No. <laughs> Little See, windmill I, going I around. I would agree. I, I <laughs> totally agree with Gavin that this is rather fatuous. But I believe the error is one of vulgarity. I don't believe it's theological, to the extent that Gavin does. And as we were discussing this before the show, it, part of this comes from my lack of the experience of the holiness that Gavin describes in these ancient medieval cathedrals. 99% of American church architecture is awful. They could be knocked down tomorrow and the world would be a better place. Um, my building is only four years old. Uh, the, the sanctuary is only four years old. I, and therefore, this sense of ancient mysteries and God's presence, I'm sorry, it's just not part of my experience. Well, now, that having been said, this, um, this the, the, the theological distinction that I would make with Gavin, and I won't, don't want to press this too hard because this is not the ditch I'm going to die in, but I am rather relaxed and comfortable no, we don't have animals for liturgical purposes. We have animals because they are part of the need, emotional pastoral needs of some people at a certain stage of life. And if we have facilities that work well to bring, for an elderly woman to bring her little dog with her to church, then I will do so. I will see that it is done. George, it's more, now, than, it's, it's more than vulgar. The, the problem is, it, 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 it's, it's all... A, it, at the heart of this is how do people get a relationship with God? Well, they don't get it through buildings, Gavin, because that's idolatry. No, they when don't. Christ, no, they don't get it through buildings because <laughs> when the temple—that's th the whole point of Christianity. The yeah, temple I, no longer exists. I think we are on Mount Scopus the in Israel. Here. The, the temple exists in the, Christ is the new temple, and that spiritual presence is found in the heart of the believer. It is not found in a place. We don't bow towards Jerusalem to worship. We are not Muslims where we face Mecca. And, and, and to, to put, no, but Kevin, Kevin. I'm um, making your point for you in a second. No, but I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I agree with all that Gavin has said, but I think uh, some of the criticisms that I've seen, I dismiss out of hand because we have, if you will, the continual ex, the Roman Catholic cranky people. Oh, give it back to the Catholic Church. Well, my God, the Catholic Church in England is no better than the Church of England. That's not going to make things any better. And, you know, that sort of idiotic argument just sort of makes me my roll my eyes. But I give, I give credit for the intentions. I take the merits away from the execution, and I don't agree with, uh, with the success of what they're doing. Gavin's point is very good. Do you find Jesus Christ moving a small little ball around a maze. However, that Christ that you're going to find is not set in a certain secret spot in the building. It's found in your heart and through faith of the Holy Spirit, which is not contained in a place. The, in America, we have the National Cathedral. It's not an official cathedral of America, but uh, it's occupied currently and for the longest time by the Episcopal Church. If by chance... It's always been by the Episcopal <laughs> Church, Kevin. Uh, if, it was built by the Episcopal Church. Masons in the Episcopal Church. And if by chance they took all the pews out and they had a multi-level uh, putt-putt golf set up there, I wouldn't care. I mean, it, that church has been dead for so long, putt-putt golf could do no more damage to the Episcopal Church or to the National Cathedral uh, than... It does in in the Church of England. So can I can I just answer George's because sure, it's a very yeah, absolutely oh. that's what this show is for. George George is uh, <laughs> hung around my neck. The possibility I believe salvation comes through stones. No, no, not that at all. Um, what I'm saying is that of course you're not saved by a cathedral. But what do cathedrals do? They are the most extraordinary um, emblematic enterprise which gives you an encounter of the possibility of God. How? Because they, in, they, they put you face to face with awe and transcendence. So they take your breath away. This is an, this is an awesome place we are in. And the lines of the, of the, of, of the, of the building and the, 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 the space itself uh, is intended to take people's breath away, and it does, and, and by extension, allow them to think of the, of the awesomeness and the infiniteness and the beauty of God. And at the same time, they bring God 
very close. So they do transcendence and imminence because they bring Jesus close to you by virtue of the fact that the Bible is there and the sacraments are there and people are kneeling there in prayer. So this building works to represent God as he's made himself known to us in, in, a, in a tactile and tangible way. Now, um, not everyone's going to get interpret the signs like that, but some people are. But to do that, you have to go in and be quiet. You have to go in and go, oh, my goodness, what is this place saying? Uh, what, what, what is my response to what this place is saying? And by this means, you might find something of the living God. But the great theological error is that, of course, to, to, to find God, you have to want you have to want to find him. So to do that in a cathedral, you have to go into a cathedral ready to find him, to look for him. If you go into a cathedral ready to pay a pitch and putt, it's not going to happen. And that's my, that's my theological uh, annoyance about the project. You cannot trick people uh, into an experience of God by entertainment and distraction. And I, every, uh, everything that you just said, I think I agree with completely. Good. And, <laughs> and, and it is more than a building because we consecrate these uh, churches and cathedrals. And we, uh, when they're no longer used to us or they're broken down and we moved on to a different place because of population growth and stuff like that, we deconsecrate them. In now, the I'm an American of a certain type, and my understanding of consecration is we have no really consecrated buildings in the United States. Because when John Winthrop gave his sermon in Southampton before the Mayflower set off to America, they consecrated this land. To, to the and entire land. and the entire United States as a shining city on the hill, not any particular spot, not any particular uh, place, um, but rather this whole nation as an ongoing uh, act of worship of God in this world. I'm not running out on you. My, my computer's about to crash. I'm no, sorry, but... plug it in. Hurry up. Uh, so, right now. So, so my, my, my point is that I have more, less uh, sympathy for special buildings as I do for special lands and special people. Now, are you still the president of the Ronald Reagan Association for Florida? Did George cry? Uh-oh. No, Brian right. Hill speech, <laughs> as did John F. Kennedy. That's right. As uh -huh. did Mitt Romney. So if we've got a Mormon, uh, a Catholic, <laughs> and, what, and a member of the United Church of Christ, plus Ronald Reagan, citing this understanding of what America is to be. Um, to me, that's the higher ideal than a rather shabby building uh, that has uh, mold and dry rot and the carpets are dirty. Okay, you just um, mentioned presidents. Let, this is a great transition for a press release that was uh, put out by the uh, National Cathedral uh, condemning the current president of the United States for remarks he's made over the last two years and I thought we could talk about that because it's a, an Episcopal issue and uh, uh, people who have no theology new vo no voice in Christ uh, want to have a political voice which is all they've ever had uh, let's talk about the the press release George well I'll be tiny bit picky and say it's not an Episcopal issue it's an issue for three Episcopalians That's who right. happen to be <laughs> the big dean and canon of the Washington National Cathedral. They That's released a statement just before the Democratic presidential debates denouncing President Trump's language in describing Baltimore and uh, the four uh, congressmen who go by the moniker the squad. And it was really harsh and over the top. And, and I pay no never mind. Uh, it's their right to say these things. They've they asked by the press, well, does this mean that President Trump is not allowed to, to the cathedral? He's not, you're going to withdraw its services for funerals and state functions? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, we're just trying to uh, uh, sort of persuade people to vote and think in a certain way. Well, my, my response to that is, is what I call the, how should I, if you're no good at your day job, I'm not going to pay much attention to you when you give me advice on how to do something else. The Diocese of Washington is in a free fall. The National Cathedral is a lovely uh, architectural mausoleum, but it has, as Kevin said, it has no real spiritual vigor or power or oomph or heft in the religious world of the United States. 
It's just a big church on a hill in D.C. whose leaders every so often like to say and do silly things. In fact, Why should I care the slightest? An 18-hole putt-putt golf course would be an improvement. <laughs> a big improvement for the cathedral. One of the things that, that, that a man called Tim Stanley said, which I thought was very clever, I wish I'd thought of it first, was that if the Church of England really wanted to be provocative in, 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 relation, in relation to golf and, 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 and cathedrals, uh, it should go and build a cathedral on some golf course somewhere <laughs> and, it, and invite the people playing golf to get into the cathedral on their fairway. And then uh, uh, that would have a more provocative and, and, uh, and positive effect. I think I want to, to say just very briefly that in terms of consecration and holiness, we, we have talked about in the past how cathedrals have been empty, in fact, of the presence of God, if you like, uh, uh, almost ready for the desecration of pitch and putt. But I, th I think... The, the issue about consecration is that we, we begin with prayers for holiness and these prayers then have to be implemented by our practice. So as, as we pray and as we worship and as we make ourselves present, it's not the oldness of the stones, it's the depth of the prayer and the integrity that, 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 that matter then somehow absorbs. And, and we can argue about that if we like, but, the, but, but the, once stones are holy, once people are holy, we ought to we ought to have the, the sensitivity to recognize the holiness. And I, I think, I, I have no idea how, how the atmosphere in Rochester I have been in for, for, for a long time, but my, my fear is that you're going to put pitch and putt in. You haven't even got to the point where you could recognize holiness if it, if it tapped you on the head and blessed you, which is yeah. tragic. Yeah, but let me push you on this issue uh, in a supportive way. Because, <laughs> again, I agree with everything that you've said. However... I think actually what happened in Canterbury Cathedral a year or two ago was worse in the sense that they, the, the chapter of Canterbury Cathedral took a great deal of money from a Grand Lodge of Freemasonry in England uh, to refurbish uh, some of its uh, uh, stonework. And the part of the thanks the cathedral allowed was that the all-seeing eye, I believe, or one of the Masonic symbols were carved into the fabric of the cathedral um it is canterbury cathedral uh, has this been de facto deconsecrated mm. uh by having a not uh, an aggressively non-christian symbol carved into its side i mean I does that what does that do for the holiness of the building i think it impairs it most most profoundly um, but i think what we're talking about is, is the relationship of insult and injury. Uh, the Canterbury Cathedral has been severely injured by that, and what's happening in Rochester Cathedral is an insult. But, but, the, fact, but you know, the fact that you add insult to injury doesn't make either of them better. It's just the combination reflects very poorly on, on the Church of England as a church in pursuit of the living God and capable of recognizing him. Well, I, I, I do want to give a personal anecdote on that point. Kevin and I went to the... Uh... ACNA uh, uh, assembly that was held in Latrobe, Pennsylvania a few years ago. And we also went on a pilgrimage to the golf club where Arnold Palmer started off his career and we paid homage to the putter that was mounted in a case where he won his first Masters tournament. Uh, so I think there are secular equivalents to these pilgrimages to Canterbury and Rochester. And uh, for some golfers, to... <laughs> the Holy Grail, you know, hit, uh, uh, Arnold Palmer's uh, uh, clubs and his trophies have the same uh, same resonance as does a piece of a true cross held in Rochester Cathedral. Yeah, we got to ride in Mr. Rogers' uh, a trolley as well. Lots of fun. Okay, gentlemen, we have entertained our audience as much as possible for Friday. It's going to be a nice weekend wherever you are. Get out, spend some time after you've shared the program after you've commented on the program, after you've liked the program, if you really have to do this to the program, that's fine. We don't care. We just want to know you're out there. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conker. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to episode 522 of Anglican Unscripted on August the 2nd, Friday. <laughs> <laughs>